Welcome everybody. We'll get started at five after the hour. Thanks for taking time out of your day today to see this great webinar. Much more to come. All right, well, let's get started. Um, very happy to have everyone here today, including our uh, company partner vendors. Uh, this webinar is about imaging and the incredible impact on science. As you can see, I added uh, subtitles to my speaking. So if English is a second language, maybe uh, you'll be able to uh, read what I'm saying, or if you're hard of hearing. So today's agenda, rules of engagement and introductions, industry perspective, very short industry perspective. Vendor partners will each have 20 minutes and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. So rules of engagement, put your questions in or comments in the chat or the Q&A box. We'll address those at the end. This way, it gives every partner vendor uh, time to complete their, their talk. We'll moderate the questions with the panelists, and the panelists can ask questions of each other, and everyone will have access to this afterwards as it will go on demand. Today's speakers include Christoph Gonsler. He's head of product at Perkin Elmer. Peter Drent, company founder, Confocal, NL, Philip Kantz, Doctor of Medical Science. He's the CEO of KML Vision. And Felix baldolf Lenchen, CEO of Altus Labs. These four companies are gonna bring a different perspective to imaging uh, and the impact that they're making today. Uh, I think you're gonna see, in the end, I think we're all working towards quality of life and general understanding. So. Uh, Imaging is definitely doing that. 
So let me just give some things that I'm seeing in imaging sciences today. I've, I've been heavily involved in imaging for the past, I'd say 20, 25 years. Um, and from a multitude of aspects, primarily from the scientific informatics point of view. Remember, a picture is worth a thousand words. This image here is the actual first camera photograph ever recorded of a human. Um, and that was in 1838. So it's been 183 years since that photograph and a lot of technological advances obviously have happened. So in my opinion, seeing is believing. So diagnostics using cameras, x-rays, MRI, ultrasound, you just go down the whole gamut of technologies. Scanning, uh, tunneling microscopy, cryo electron microscopy, all the different microscopies, you'll get to see some of that today. Crystallography, particle detection, all learning, you know, we're, we're all learning and it's evolving extremely fast. Some kind of examples to give, to kind of, I guess, level the playing field or, or tell us where we came from. So Leonardo da Vinci with his sketches and his drawings uh, to enhance medical sciences. Dmitry uh, Mendeleev, this was the first writings of the periodic table. This is 1869. The Hadrosaurus was the first dinosaur skeleton to go on display. That was in the uh, 1870s from the Smithsonian. Understanding how horses run and do they actually lift all their feet off the ground? This was in 1882, a horse in motion. This was the first x-ray in 1895 by Wilhelm Conrad, Conrad Roken. Rosalind Franklin and the crystallography of DNA. Neutrinos captured in a hydrogen bubble chamber. Uh, a first image of, uh, of the structure of silicon crystal lattice taken by a tunneling mi microscope. Uh, and that was in 1983. And uh, the pentacene molecule by IBM research. And then NASA's recent image of a cell um, and there's some enhancement done in this, but pretty amazing to see where we've come in 183 years. So that's awesome. And I think what you're gonna see today is gonna be pretty awesome, but I think the most critical part and lessons learned that we have is that the scientific and medical informatics part of all of this. So not only learning from it, but getting that secondary and tertiary reuse out of imaging is critical. Um, and there's a lot of challenges around imaging from a size perspective, a usability perspective, data quality, point of capture, storage and retrieval, and then making it all findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This is something that we can do along the way and a lot of people spend a lot of time on, for instance, DICOM standards and a lot of other standards. Um, but getting that right will allow us to discover a lot more, a lot faster. In other words, innovate. So that's all my little part. And now I'd like to turn it over to Felix. Thanks very much, John. All right. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Can you all see this? Loading, there we go. Perfect. All right, um, my name is Felix baldoff Lenschen. I'm the founder and CEO of Altus Labs. We're a company based in uh, Toronto and um, we're uh, on a mission to uh, help accelerate um, and reduce the cost of clinical development uh, and help guide personalized treatment with prognostic imaging biomarkers that are fully automated with a focus on radiological uh, imaging. So 
Uh, imaging is obviously an extremely rich type of data, and we believe it is extremely underutilized. So um, here you see a CT scan, which is essentially a three-dimensional reconstruction of the entire chest of a, of a human. Uh, and some of the benefits of radiological imaging, which many of you are, are aware, is that it's one, it's digital, uh, you can acquire it longitudinally, it's non-invasive, and it's fairly inexpensive to acquire. And uh, radiological imaging has been used for decades across disease areas, um, not just in standard of care when it comes to screening and diagnosis, uh, you know, looking for comorbidities, uh, quantifying response to treatment, um, and uh, for, for surveillance, but also in clinical trials uh, to define uh, and identify eligible patients, uh, to randomize patients into control uh, and treatment arms, to stratify patients, um, and to, uh, to quantify treatment effect and essentially predict efficacy using imaging endpoints. But unfortunately, um, we humans are uh, fairly limited in how we can comprehend imaging data uh, and communicate our findings, uh, which unfortunately, unfortunately leads to fairly simplistic and oftentimes flawed interpretation criteria that are not necessarily that clinically meaningful. Um, and it also leads to some pretty high discordance rates uh, between readers um, when it comes to uh, you know, uh, interpreting that imaging data. Um, and so for us, um, there's, you know, the traditional way in which we interpret this imaging data uh, in solid tumor trials, for example, uh, is by measuring tumor diameters uh, to um, add up into a tumor burden and see how that tumor burden changes over time to then assess is a patient getting better or worse. Um, now, when we when we distill all of this information into a single diameter measurement, we're actually missing out on a lot of other very useful prognostic information. You know, there's the actual tumor tissue that can have a lot of prognostic value, the peritumoral tissue. Uh, and when it comes to, you know, uh, an overall survival endpoint, uh, there are also a lot of comorbidities at play here that should be factored in to this. And so um, ultimately, uh, you know, you're distilling a lot of this information into tabular, very simplistic data, while the CT scan, you know, actually is made up of um, dozens of millions of pixels that uh, deep learning and computer vision uh, actually has the capability of quantifying in ways that, um, that were previously not possible to do. Some examples here um, of uh, of where imaging actually underestimates treatment effect in clinical trials is in the PD-1 space, uh, where uh, here you see a list of 10 trials uh, that were conducted uh, that had both imaging surrogate endpoints, progression-free survival, as well as uh, the overall survival endpoint, which is considered the gold standard um, in, uh, in oncology trials. So uh, of these 10 trials, seven of the trials ended up showing that the treatment resulted in survival benefit. But of those seven trials, five actually predicted um, negative survival if you were to look at the progression-free survival endpoint. So this means that if you had only been looking at the imaging endpoint, you would have likely expected five of those seven trials to actually not yield clinical benefit. And so for sponsors, it's extremely important to uh, you know, not deprioritize assets early on in clinical development where all you have is the imaging data uh, and you know, have that mislead you in deprioritizing assets that could have uh, you know, been extremely big commercial successes and you know, become treatments that really improve patient outcomes. So, um, at the end of the day, uh, what John said earlier, it's really about helping patients live longer and better lives. And so how can we uh, uh, improve our ability to really interpret this imaging data uh, and accelerate clinical development of the most promising therapies? 
So we've developed a system uh, that essentially takes in the entire three-dimensional imaging data uh, of a uh, computer uh, community tomography scan to predict survival directly from all of the features inherent in the body. And um, the, way that we, uh, the way that we deploy this and process the data is essentially through multiple segmentation algorithms that identify the entire body within the scan, uh, as well as the organs of interest. So for lung cancer patients, we're talking uh, the lungs, but also other vital organs like the heart, uh, where uh, you know a lot of comorbidities will be present, given that, for example, over 25% of lung cancer patients will actually die of cardiovascular disease, not the actual lung cancer. And in an overall survival uh, endpoint, it's important to be able to capture that information. Um, in order to be able to train a model to predict survival from the entire scans, you obviously need a lot of data. And so the way that uh, we work um, with our partners uh, is by working closely with large cancer centers um, and uh, we collate uh, you know, significant um, amounts of retrospective data, the imaging, the outcomes, the two most important pieces of data, as well as demographic information, histology, pathology, molecular testing, uh, in addition to the treatment history, um, in order to develop these prognostic biomarkers that are fully automated. And these biomarkers uh, we then uh, uh, implement in our software and make them accessible to clinical trial sponsors who are conducting trials, uh, you know, and indications um, for which we have these prognostic biomarkers. And in a lot of these, these diseases, it's also uh, fairly difficult to stratify patients, which make these, you know, complicated trials to run, complicated trials to actually design, require, you know, significant amounts uh, amount of patients to actually generate uh, statistical significance and quantifying that treatment effect. Uh, and so improving the ability to stratify patients and quantify treatment effect can make um, you know, these sorts of trials and these um, complex diseases uh, much more approachable. Uh, here's a snapshot of the data that, that we're using to date. Um, uh, in, uh, in the work that we're doing, uh, mainly in oncology, cardiovascular disease, and pulmonology. Uh, so a lot of images, uh, a lot of time between the image acquisition and the outcomes, and a lot of clinical events, uh, again, which are the most important outcome that we care about uh, when it comes to running trials uh, and stratifying patients. Some examples of the work that we've done here in lung cancer, uh, this is currently under review, the Journal of Clinical Oncology uh, shows our ability to, to predict five-year survival from a baseline CT scan uh, for stage one, two, and three patients here. So the red uh, lines, the Kaplan-Meier curves here, uh, indicate the predicted high-risk patients that have uh, you know, significantly worse outcomes than the, um, the, uh, the lowest risk patients in the green line that you see here uh, across the board. Um, and this is also, uh, you know, some of the work that we've published at ASCO over the past couple of years, uh, showing a 79% improvement in predicting two-year survival compared to tumor size measurements. Uh, and this, another uh, presentation from ASCO showing uh, our ability to stratify uh, lung cancer patients that received surgery into uh, risk quint uh, quintiles. So again, Coming back to um, you know, our ability to take in you know, the full CT scans and generate these automated uh, survival predictions, um, I want to get into some of the details of you know, uh, how we want to make sense of these insights. Um, so again, looking at you know, this patient stratification, we also want to understand what is the model looking at when making this prediction? Is it uh, you know, considering the tumor? Is it considering age? Is it considering sex? Uh, and so in doing the stratification, we wanted to compare, um, you know, the variables, uh, the known prognostic variables like histology, like tumor stage, like sex, like age, and see how those uh, correlate uh, to the model predictions, which is the, the column that you see in the furthest left. So again, looking at this graph, um, these are the risk decals from decal one being the lowest risk to decal 10 being the highest risk. Uh, and we wanted to see um, how the prognostic variables change as we go down the risk spectrum. And 
We're really excited to see that, for example, the median age uh, increases from 62 to 65 years, as expected. Um, we know that males are at greater risk um, of adverse outcome in lung cancer than females. So seeing that uh, ratio between male and female switch as you go down the risk spectrum. And similarly, tumor size and stage increases um, as we go down that, uh, that risk spectrum as well. So pretty exciting to see how much of this uh, known prognostic information the model seems to be able to capture from the CT scan alone. The other um, aspect that we wanted to look at is think about how the attention is placed across different areas in the image. And so to do that, uh, we generated these grad cam heat maps uh, and looked at you know, where in the anatomy is the model placing attention for individual patients to generate the outcome predictions and to compare how much attention the model placed on tumors, because that's what we humans really care about when we're interpreting uh, imaging from cancer patients is we segmented volumetrically all the primary tumors uh, in the subset of data and wanted to quantify how much attention on average is placed on the tumor area, which the model uh, you know, uh, was not um, essentially um, uh, trained to look at specifically, but we found that there's about twice as much attention placed on the tumor than on the rest of the thorax for these lung cancer patients, which is really exciting to see, again, showing that the model has learned uh, by examples of thousands of patients uh, that the tumors have prognostic value. And this is sort of a very differentiated approach to the standard radiomics work that is being done uh, where you, know, you require a manual segmentation of a tumor to extract features of interest. Uh, that can you know, have some limited applicability when it comes to generalizability across patients. And you're really implicating um, and you're forcing the model to only consider uh, specific features that us humans believe have prognostic value. Whereas here, uh, the model uh, is essentially set loose to consider any and all prognostic variables uh, that are important in predicting survival within the entire image. So, um, these models uh, we are able to essentially deploy in our cloud-based platform Noda uh, in which we enable sponsors to conduct exploratory research uh, on these uh, on their existing clinical trial imaging data and complement the traditional uh, RESIST 1.1 type of interpretation uh, that uh, that is, is being done uh, on this imaging data and um, we enable sponsors to then ingest uh, that data and manage that data um, in, a, in a database. We uh, provide our models um, to allow them to generate these automated predictions from the baseline and follow-up CT scans, uh, and then use those predictions um, to inform their, um, their clinical trial design for future trials um, to really quantify treatment effect uh, more accurately in their completed trials and think about, um, you know, uh, how they might want to prioritize a, an asset within their broader pipeline um, uh, and potentially even you know, revive uh, some historical trials where the imaging endpoint, uh, like in those immunotherapy trials that I showed earlier, might have actually been misleading um, in uh, under, um, uh, uh, underrepresenting the actual treatment effect that those trials have had. So at this point, I'll, um, I'll switch over uh, to, uh, to Noda, um, our software platform, to give you a quick run through of an example um, of, uh, of some of the work that we're doing with our customers. Uh, so this is our dashboard where you can see um, your clinical trials. Uh, and by opening this trial here, um, this is a, a synthetic data set that we generated um, that, um, that sort of illustrates a, a hypothetical phase two trial focused on non-small cell lung cancer stage four patients. Uh, this is a two-arm trial with a primary endpoint of uh, objective response rate, secondary endpoint of PSS, uh, PFS. And here we're looking at uh, sort of an interim analysis of the data that has already been generated. And you'll see uh, here in terms of um, this bar chart where we currently are. So uh, about the, the median patient has gone through um, uh, baseline and four follow-ups of CT scans at this point. Uh, so the first thing I'll show is just um, to, uh, to basically 
upload uh, a new CT scan here uh, that has been you know, generated at a trial site. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, um, and upload uh, the, uh, the DICOM images for this new scan. Um, and uh, so this is essentially adding um, the CT scan to the, the clinical trial database that you see here and preps it to be processed uh, by the model that predicts survival uh, for, you know, from this CT scan here. Um, and this is going to allow us to essentially have the most, you know, recent uh, predictions from the most recent scans uh, inform the predicted uh, Kaplan-Meier curves of this trial at this interim analysis. So you'll see the sample CT scan here. Um, we can go ahead and, um, and see that in this patient journey graph. So this is a baseline scan. Uh, if we open that, we can, uh, we can actually view the CT scan uh, in just a second here as it's loading and, uh, and conduct any sort of um, you know, manual interpretation that we, that we might want. Uh, so in this setting here, we have our Resist 1.1 workflow uh, enabled. So uh, as I scroll through the scan, you know, we can look for some of the, the primary lesions. Um, and uh, let's see here, I think there's one in the, in the left lung. Yeah, just on the right here. Um, so this is our, our image viewer uh, that we use, um, and uh, I can go ahead and add a new lesion. Uh, we'll go ahead and segment this just to get a more accurate uh, diameter measurement uh, from this, um, both the long and short axis. Uh, we'll classify this as a measurable lesion uh, since it's over 10 millimeters in diameter. Uh, we'll say this is the primary lesion uh, in the uh, left lung. And this is a target. We'll go ahead and save that. Uh, and then you'll see that also get populated um, in the database here with an 11.3 millimeter diameter uh, for this scan. Um, if we go over to the analysis section here, um, to the overview, uh, you'll see essentially an aggregate of all of these um, uh, scans and predictions uh, that we got from, um, from all of the previous CTs uh, that have been pre-processed, the body segmentation has been done, the organ segmentation has been done, uh, and the survival prediction has been done automatically as soon as the CT scans are, um, are acquired. Uh, and looking at that Kaplan-Meier curve, uh, we're then able to you know, view the predicted Kaplan-Meier curve for uh, both you know, the investigational arm uh, and the, the control arm. Um, and we can even filter that by specific time points. So, for example, if we only wanted to look at the um, predicted outcomes of uh, the control arm patients uh, from their baseline scan, so before any treatment started, uh, we can see here that uh, the median survival, predicted survival is 15 months. And if instead we wanted to also uh, um, layer over the investigational arm, uh, we can actually see that pre-treatment, so at randomization, there's actually a difference in the median survival, which is going to be really important to know um, uh, in order to quantify treatment effects properly. So here we see that um, the investigational arm actually has a 14-month median survival at baseline predicted. Uh, so we want to know that the control arm has a one-month uh, better median survival than the treatment arm uh, because, you know, in these sorts of settings, this is going to impact uh, your, your drug's ability to show an improved survival. And this is, you know, really important information to be aware of as you're quantifying treatment effect. Um, if we go back to the overview section of the analysis here, uh, we can also look at some other graphs. Uh, for example, uh, I'll just quickly populate everything again. Uh, looking at the change from baseline, looking at tumor burden, uh, as well as uh, survival. And the interesting part to me is really the, the difference between the change in baseline of tumor burden and the change in baseline from predicted survival. And those discrepancies, um, like this case here, for example, where tumor burden has only reduced by 5%, meaning it's still stable disease, while survival has actually increased uh, by 96%, so survival has doubled for this patient, even though the tumor burden has stayed constant. We can click into that uh, and look at this patient again at both the tumor burden and the survival. Uh, we can see here that this top line 
uh, tumor burden has stayed relatively stable, whereas the survival really starts increasing at follow-up two and follow-up three, the predicted survival. Uh, and if we want to then click into the follow-up three, um, I actually preloaded this, given that it's uh, a lot of CTs that need to load, um, you'll see that um, uh, we can pull up that scan uh, and look at the, um, you know, where the model has actually paid attention to generate the prediction. Um, and so we'll see some of the, the tumors that have been, uh, that have been measured as per Resist 1.1. Uh, here, I'll zoom in a little bit uh, as well um, in the original scan that has the heat maps overlaid. And it's, it's nice to see here that the model is paying uh, uh, some attention to that primary tumor, uh, but it looks like it's also looking at a number of other features that uh, you know, we currently uh, cannot necessarily quantify uh, here in the left, in the right lung, for example. Um, so you know, this is just to walk you through an example of, um, of how uh, the survival predictions can really um, complement some of the existing uh, image interpretation that is being done um, and, uh, and really provide some additional insight as to how um, uh, how imaging uh, can really uh, complement uh, the treatment effect quantification in clinical trials. John, I'll stop there and yeah, happy to take any questions uh, when everyone else has presented. Thanks very much. Thanks, Felix. That was great. Really appreciate it. Okay, Peter from Confocal, um, you're up next. Let me share my screen. Oh. Oh, 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 I'm going to make you dizzy, guys. Sorry. Okay. I'm Peter. I work for Convocal.nl. I'm going to talk about imaging living cells. And if we talk about li imaging living cells, we talk about microscopy. Now we have to talk about microscopy components, like we, have, we need to have light, so we need to have a laser. We need to see light, so we need a detector. And if the cells are alive, we need to have some speed to catch them. But most of this is keeping cells happy. Because if you bring cells into an uncomfortable situation, and light can do that, the cells will die. Imaging in living cells in the life sciences, fluorescence is uh, one of the most common used tool. And I'm sorry if I'm going to be a little bit very basic for the top microscopists in the room, but uh, I'm sure there are also some people in the room that are not so familiar with fluorescence. So what is fluorescence? Fluorescence is you plant a flag on an item you want to follow. So I'm sure that people want to see this kit in traffic, that's why there is a flag, so you can see where it's moving around. But you have to imagine that there is not an unlimited, oh no, that it's not an unlimited amount of cells that can be labeled or features in the cells that can be labeled. So you have a labeling density. And the difficult thing of these flags is, you know, they break down. You know, once you have uh, uh, seen them, you can see them once, you can see them twice, maybe sometimes thrice, but then they are gone. So these flags have a very, very limited availability. And sometimes if you want to be very specific, you want to see the, a single flag. You want to see a single flag. And if you want to see a single flag, then you need to have good eyes, very sharp eyes, very sensitive eyes. Okay, so if you look at this picture, this is one of my favorite pictures. You know, basically the young mother knows the importance of light. If a young mother goes to the beach with the baby, the first thing she does is sunblock. You know, she wants to protect the baby against the sunlight because light has a, an effect on cells, on cells behavior. So what do we do in microscopy? Very often what we have done now or in the past, and I hope not in future, 
I cannot see anything, so I turn off the light. That's the wrong approach. We have to be very, very careful with light. We want to use as little light as possible. Somehow. Okay. So this is for me, this was uh, an, an experiment, which was a game changer when I realized uh, how important it is to follow living cells over a long time. This is an experiment that lasted 61 hours. We took us every 10 seconds, we took an image and then we deconvolved them to a final resolution of 120 nanometer. So on the left side, you can see the raw image. On the right side, you can see the deconvolved image. What does deconvolved mean is if you know every, every optical system has a mistake. If you know you're imaging a ball, but you see a cloud, you know there is a mistake, okay? So the computer can, can, can change the cloud into a ball. So we can improve the resolution. And here you can see two cells imaged for 100, with 22,000 images at 120 nanometer resolution. You can see the mitochondria. So you can see in the cell, over all this period, you can see the mitochondria moving. You can see a dynamic of the mitochondria behavior. But if you would follow the whole video, and the whole video is on our website, you can see these cells are still happy. They are dividing until the end. And you can see, you can download a white paper where we analyze the intensity. You know, we have no bleaching over these 61 hours. We use a confocal microscope. And what is a confocal microscope? A confocal microscope, I always say, uh, traditional microscopes, you will see a wooden plank, and the confocal microscope uh, converts this plank into a book. You make thin optical sections, and you can read the book with, with the computer. And the confocal microscope has a very important point, which is the pinhole. And in the traditional systems, behind the pinhole, you have the photomultiplier tube. And the photomultiplier tube measures the average intensity over the pinhole. But we hate the photomultiplier tube, we like the cameras. So we put behind the pinhole a second scanning mirror set that is painting the emission light coming from the specimen on the camera. Okay, I'll explain it in a moment once more, but why we want to use the camera, why we don't like the photomultiplier tube. The photomultiplier tube is old technology. You know, it has a quantum efficiency of 25 sometimes 30%. But if you look to the right, you can see the cameras, they have quantum efficiencies of 90%. So the camera can convert light much more efficient into signal than the photomultiplier tube, even in the different wavelength areas. So this is why we want to use the camera, because if you have only very few flags, if they are breaking down, you would like to use the most sensitive detector. So we use still two scanning mirror sets. Um, one we call the scanner and one we call the rescanner. And there's a, a whole movie explanation on our website, but in short, this is how we improve the resolution. This is the science behind it. So in situation one, the scanner and the rescanner are fully synced, scan the same area, nothing special is happening. What you see is what you get. Then in situation two, we're going to paint the image that we are seeing in the specimen on twice as large area. You can see it in the back. If you go to situation three, you, you, you notice that to cover this nice long area, our dot has to go fast. So we have to add some motion blur, okay? But now the magic is happening. When you scale back this big image to the original side, you can see that we improve the resolution. We reduce the diameter of the green dot by the square root of two, by 40%. So our confocal system uses a very sensitive detector, but also improves the resolution at no cost. Okay, this is a little bit of physics, I'm sorry, but uh, this is it's going to be important. Uh, the image brightness of an optical system is related to the NA numerical aperture to the power four divided by the magnification of two. It's, it's physics. Here we have some numbers of a 
This is coming from the Nikon website. You can see a whole list of uh, microscope objective lenses, different magnifications, different uh, numeric apertures. And you can see that a combination, the 40X 1.3 in this case, is the most brightest lens in the whole portfolio. Again, we want to be see very sensitive signal, very little signal, so we can use the most uh, the, the, the most optimum lens that generates the highest intensity. And if you look at the market, there are several uh, microscope objective manufacturers, and you can see that even two of them, they offer 40x 1.4. So the 1.4 seems a little different to the 1.3, but in brightness, it's 35% difference. So we decided, okay, we want to use this 40x 1.4. So if you look at different lenses, the Plum Upper Combat Series, 40X 1.4, 60X 1.4, 100X 1.4, they all have the same numeric aperture. So they have the same resolution. But the 40X is six times brighter than the 100X. So as a biologist, what lens you want to use? Of course, the 40X lens, because you see lots of biology at the highest intensity. Now, there are different, different uh, confocal systems, super resolution systems on the market. Um, but important is, um, of course, the field of view. But look at the laser power. Now, because we can work with the 40x 1.4, we can work with nanowatts of laser light. While other systems that can achieve similar resolution, although also they use a camera as detector, they use tens of one hundredths of milliwatts. So look at the big, big, big chain, the diff difference in uh, illumination power that is used. So the advantage of brightness is less noise, more, more signal. Of course, low laser power, lower phototoxicity. And yes, you can keep your cells happy over a longer time. But the lower magnification for biologists also means more, more field of view. And here you can see this field of view. This is the synaptonormal complex. Uh, think about it, these are chromosome strands. On the left side, you can see a whole field of view. And now you can just zoom in on the right side. Now, a factor of 10, easily you can zoom in. Look at the amount of biology that you can see. And then, of course, you can do the deconvolution trick again. So you can improve the resolution. 170 nanometer on the left side, 120 nanometer on the right side. And now you can see the spacing between the strands of the period. So we're not giving them too much light, but we're getting all the resolution information from them. And then, you know, I always say, this is better than Netflix. I can watch this for hours. Here you can see division happening. You can see chromosomes being separated. You know, all of this in space. So we can do this without averaging. We, because of the larger field of view, we don't miss any cells that are divided. You know, we get better results, more results. And this we can achieve without photo pitch. So this is a recent development that uh, all box, the, uh, the RCM2 is the box that generated the images just before, got a smaller brother. And the smaller brother became, or is very important for life synergy because it has speed. You know, on the left side, we did time-lapse imaging. So we took an image every 10 seconds, for instance. But on the right side of the box, the NL5, we generate 25 frames per second. And if you want to work with 25 frames per second, yes, you need to add a little bit more light. Okay. But we can go fast. And the traditional system to going fast in microscopy is the spinning disk system. Maybe some of you have heard this. But the spinning disk system has a disadvantage because it has multiple holes. When going deeper into the tissue, the information is jumping from one hole to another one. So the resolution is being sacrificed. Our system, the NL5, which uses a line for illumination, a slit for illumination, well, can go deep and keeps image quality very well. So here we have some, uh, some uh, 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 examples. This is a single cell. You know, we can, you can start, study very fast cell dynamics with low phototoxicity. Now on the next slide, I put it a little bit bigger. 
Please note this is a single cell, okay? In, recorded in 3D. And now you can see the cell alive, see the activity in the cell. And this you can do without damaging the cell with phototoxicity. Because we can work with lower magnification, it also can work with bigger animals. So this is a zebrafish. So a zebrafish that we are following in development over a day. So the clip that you're seeing, that I want to bring up a little bigger again now, this is recording over a day, this, a 3D section, because of the fast imaging of the NO5 was made every 10 minutes. And this is a time-lapse of one day of development of a zebrafish. You can see the detail. So I guess in my 20 minutes, we covered a little bit more about lasers. You need to use a laser, but be very, very careful. Do not harm yourselves. Use the most sensitive detector you can get because you can reduce the laser power even further. There is speed available. So this is the combination from, from using low phototoxicity and high speed imaging, keeping yourselves happy. I want to thank you. If you want to have more information, you can visit us websites. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. That was awesome. Great work. Our next speaker will be Dr. Philip Kantz from KML Vision. Let me know if you see the screen. Yep, you're good to go. Okay, perfect. Thanks, John, for the introduction. So my name is Philip Kainz. I'm a CEO and co-founder of KML Vision, a company based in Graz in Austria. Um, little uh, background about me. So my training is in biomedical image analysis, computer vision, uh, machine and deep learning. I did my uh, MSc at the uh, University of um, Applied Sciences in Graz. And then I uh, moved on to the medical university where I did my PhD, mostly working on um, histological image analysis uh, using machine learning. And from that, um, my co-founder and I, we decided that we want to take these advancements we uh, created in the uh, academic field to the uh, economy and wanted to uh, provide um, them to a bigger audience. And now we set out to this mission to um, provide these intelligent and accessible solutions for um, the automation of labor-intensive tasks in uh, big image data use cases. So we have dedicated our work to solving um, visual analysis and inspection problems for our clients in the biopharma and medical sciences. And I don't have to tell you that imaging is everywhere in the life sciences and there is a huge growth of applications, uh, individual techniques, and of course, digital data. And uh, this is facilitated by uh, both the increasing automation of imaging devices and the use cases where imaging plays a crucial role for instance, if we take a look at the fields in drug discovery stage, uh, we uh, may find image-based applications in cell and tissue biology, uh, where automated image analysis needs to be used at the scale. And the same applies to applications in histology, cytology, and not only in human, but also in veterinary medicine, uh, where the decisions um, of decision support systems are actually um, aiding the work of pathologists in their diagnosis. And in other use cases, visual inspection is an integral part of the bio burden assessment. For instance, in, in clean room settings in pharma production, where you definitely should be interested in quantifying uh, the colony forming units uh, as part of GMP compliant manufacturing. So all these use cases have uh, one obvious thing in common. Imaging is an integral part of the scientific or operational protocols and the people are really bad at assessing digital image data without getting tired. And this discrepancy between us as humans being able to, um, or being actually the limit, limiting factor um, and the tremendous potential for these new discoveries, um, current technologies allow us to achieve. Um, this is in fact driving us to push the optimization automa of uh, these tasks to the market. So the question is, uh, what can you actually automate in order to save your staff from all this tedious work 
Uh, of course, you cannot automate everything, um, but uh, er not everything is uh, more or less economically feasible. But since the digitalization and digitization of samples is at the huge trend in the industry, there's a real chance that um, now you can jump aboard this ship and add new future proof technology to your organization. And so the question is, why should you invest in automation? So first of all, you increase the objectivity and quality. You will be able to notice um, an increase in productivity. You expand your uh, portfolio and become able to uh, automate many tasks by either using existing algorithms or maybe also training your own. And I'm almost sure that some of our participants today already have dedicated AI engineers um, who would agree that educating the stakeholders in the process of image analysis is also key for an efficient workflow. And automation gives you the opportunity to do so. And um, yeah, finally, the uh, economic reason uh, to go for automation. If you invest into automation, we'll be able to do much more um, intellectually challenging tasks for which you truly need your experts. And I'm sharing the stage today with uh, many other great companies that have a similar vision of supporting the many stakeholders uh, who are involved in this complex discovery pro uh, procedures in uh, research and development and further downstream also um, in, in clinical applications. Um, recently, I gave a talk um, about what an organization should actually consider when thinking about AI and their image analysis workflows. And the two key points um, I want to repeat here are, um, on one hand, you need to go, uh, you need good imaging hardware uh, to bridge the gap between the analog um, or the physical and the digital world. And on the other hand, you need people and high quality data to actually use machine learning and AI to your advantage. And at KML Vision, we develop ECOSA. It's a software as a service platform for collaborative image data analysis, uh, which supports you in the entire process of introducing AI into your workflows, from the data management and annotation um, to applying ready to use applications. And you even can uh, train your own deep learning analysis of applications and algorithms on the platform without any coding skills. And we have clients uh, who use ECOSA for biomarker analysis and histology, cell cultures, cardiovascular research, um, or tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Our portfolio ranges from the data analysis to uh, convenient uh, multi-user data management, all integrated into a single platform. And sometimes our clients also require specialized solutions. So we do also um, bespoke software development for them and then provide these applications um, on our platform for further use in a large scale setting. So for a couple of years now, there's an increasingly large body of scientific publications on AI and uh, image analysis and uh, giving some hints on this uh, technology how this technology actually can be used in, in practice. And uh, while many applications demonstrate that the idea of how AI can work for certain lab restricted use case, the real world application scenarios are often hugely diverse and they have their own challenges. Um, for example, there are difference in hardware and software, tissue staining, uh, sample cultivation and preparation, etc., uh, that need to be taken into account for a robust analysis solution that actually holds its promise uh, and, and keep the work away from you. And uh, we have implemented over 35 image analysis applications for our clients, and there were really a lot of learnings on both sides. So here are some examples where I wanted to show uh, what the type of um, so that actually the type of image uh, imaging modality or microscopy technique is not as significant anymore of whether you can automate this analysis because uh, everything produ produces more or less digital images. And whether it's a high content use case, host light, uh, histopathology, electron microscopy, retinal fundus imaging, uh, or even microscopic uh, photo photography, it, it really doesn't matter. And the market uh, demands extreme flexibility of these analytical tools, because especially when you're working in, um, a potent, on a potentially groundbreaking uh, scientific uh, um, project, you want to make sure that you have the state-of-the-art um, tooling employed. 
And uh, so let me share some of these um, examples of what we have done so far. Um, a classic in vitro assay in angiogenesis research is the network formation assay for which we already provide ready to use algorithms and it fully uh, automatically quantifies the network structure. Another network like uh, quantification algorithm is the CAM assay, which works for both the XVIV and in OVO observations. And one of our collaborators is using the CAM protocol extensively to establish new testing procedures as an alternative to animal models. And we are quite happy that our technology also finds such applications that reduce animal harm. In uh, the spheroid sprouting assay, we automatically quantify the body and the individual sprout morphology. And applying our AI models to these use cases allow these researchers to retrieve much more information on a higher degree of detail than, than before. And before using the algorithm, customers uh, were hiring a cohort of students, more or less, to do this uh, tedious work. But now they uh, could get rid of this uh, inherent inter-observer variability and generate uh, reliable and reproducible results. This is a classical morphometry use case where our clients wanted to uh, extract the morphological properties of the um, ultrastructure of a myocard. And we helped them to build an AI model that uh, can not only measure the areas um, of individual mitochondria, lipid droplets, and so on, but also reliably uh, measure the distance between the neighboring set stripes. And a standard application in histopathology is determining the ratios of cell populations. Um, we've developed uh, a standard KS67 uh, nuclear quantification algorithm for breast cancer. And while this Cell counting per se may seem as a trivial task cognitively, producing a reliable estimate on a digital slide of 100 by uh, 50,000 pixel is almost impossible. And in gastropathology, we've been looking into supporting the diagnostic process um, where our algorithm uh, provides from a whole slide image region uh, proposals that uh, contain Helicobacter pylori. And uh, this cuts down the turnaround time a lot, because if you think of that almost 80% of these cases do not have any bacteria in it, there's a lot of time where you actually look for something that is not there. And so far, we have seen more or less uh, 2D imaging use cases, um, larger scale, smaller scale. But if we add time, such as the, uh, an additional um, uh, dimension, such as time in the case of uh, wound healing assay, then um, we can also uh, provide the analysis for the new dimension, which is of course possible with uh, algorithms on our platform. And now let me show you a brief clip of um, segmenting cellular structures in a time series from another use case we recently implemented for our clients at the medical university in Graz. Um, this application, um, is also available for off-the-shelf usage and both tracks the individual instances over time while segmenting the cytosol and the nuclei. And they are now able to generate uh, more in-depth measurements, um, which previously was just not possible. Okay, now it works. Um, so speaking of additional um, dimensions, not only time, but also measuring in confocal stacks has been implemented by our team. And in this case, we did a collaboration project with another company here in Graz, um, where we observe uh, the total cell coverage in the process of uh, organoid development. For each time step in this uh, observation, the algorithm actually learn the projection of the total cell area from a set stack of, of images. And there's a strong trend. Um, we observed that uh, research teams more and more demand that they can create their own automated image analysis application for their custom uh, use case. And while there is an off-the-shelf software available that allows you to construct your workflow, uh, you need a good understanding of image processing um, to build your own application. And in addition, if you need AI to be thrown into this workflow, because the data is too complex um, to be analyzed with conventional methods, 
you or your team or someone in your team actually needs the knowledge uh, of data science to really uh, make sure that this is solid. Our answer to this challenge is Ecosa AI, where we provide a non-code environment for end users to train, evaluate, and run AI-based image analysis applications in no time. In almost every image analysis process, you have uh, data preparation or pre-processing, um, algorithm development, and perhaps a refinement. And finally, what you actually want to do, the analysis um, of new image data. And let's briefly compare the three options here. First, you can do a manual analysis uh, with no automation or uh, from which you actually want to evolve. Second, you can order a custom solution development uh, where you need to um, yeah, interact with a supplier and have all the overhead of going back and forth. Uh, maybe there's also some data sharing uh, policy in place, which can make it quite hard. And finally, you can use a solution such as Ecosa AI, which is fully integrated with the platform and can easily be used by any stakeholder. So we are targeting here um, biologists and medical doctors as users of the platform um, so that they can really um, use AI at their fingertips. The benefit of such a solution is that you are not depending on external experts in, in image analysis anymore, and uh, you can actually leverage this technology yourselves. Um, you can uh, be sure that the latest um, models are deployed and available for the best possible results in a safe environment. And today I want to show you how you can develop your own AI algorithm uh, on our Ecosa platform without any coding skills. And we have to put significant effort, we have put significant effort into the product development and present you with an opportunity to use AI as a service right away from the web browser. It already implements a lot of best practices um, you will find in the life cycle of, of a deep learning algorithm. And uh, to make it um, really accessible, we provide the course in the cloud. So you're welcome also to sign up for uh, free and try it out. You find the sign up link on our website as well. So the general workflow consists of training, evaluation, and finally using the algorithm in production. It starts as soon as you have uh, a set of digital images available, um, which you split into training and validation, and then you launch the training. And after each training, you can take a look at the AI training report, which contains qualitative and quantitative results on the held out image data set, which um, can uh, give you insights uh, to decide whether you want to train the algorithm with more data, uh, because at some parts, uh, the algorithm is not uh, con uh, confident enough yet, um, or if you are still or are already quite satisfied with the result and then uh, use it in production. So having in mind that the goal ultimately is to provide this unambiguous data to the algorithm, there are some best practices I wanted to share. You should provide as much information as possible to the algorithm. Um, if there are too many similar objects in the data set, this may not represent the real world and leads to poor performance in the generalization. Uh, you should annotate more images in smaller regions uh, of interest. This, this is usually better than annotating an entire uh, slide, for example. And especially working with uh, colleagues, um, you should avoid uh, assigning ambiguous semantics to the individual objects. In short, uh, when there are objects of the same class, they also should be labeled the same. And if you are in a big lab, try to avoid the domain shift by including images from multiple scanning devices. This is uh, more or less affecting the histopathology domain. And if we present the model with images as it's shown here, it looks at all regions and you can see that some are annotated and some are not. And achieving dense annotations in, is the best case you can provide, but on a whole slide, this is just impossible. So what people usually do is to create uh, sparse annotations. And that means that not all objects of a particular class are um, fully annotated in the image. So if you would uh, use this image as a training image, the model would be, ha ha would be um, having a hard time figuring out uh, why the tissue in the green region uh, should be recognized as such and the tissue in the red square should not. The good practice here is that you use regions of interest to just exclude parts uh, that are not relevant. Another aspect is, of course, prediction runtime. 
if you uh, consider um, gigapixel images, this makes some, uh, may take some time to run through and take also lots of computing resources. And to reduce this time, the model uh, doesn't need to see all the, um, all the parts in the image, but only the ones where there's a sample. And I want to briefly um, also introduce you to a use case we did with our clients, the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Experimental and Clinical Traumatology in Vienna. And they wanted to quant quantify how the regeneration of peripheral nerves is progressing under certain conditions. And they used uh, neurofilament staining to mark the regenerating axons in the nerve. And they wanted to count and measure the individual objects of, uh, for instance, um, in the different parts and compare them. So prior to using our AI-based uh, image analysis, they were not really able to quantify the accents on a larger scale. So switching to uh, ECOSA really enabled them to do much more um, with their samples and data. And as soon as the slides were digitized, they used ECOSA to annotate the individual accents. And usually these objects are only a few pixels in size. So uh, annotation can be pretty um, tedious. And I just wanted to show um, that our software also works uh, in a browser interface and you can use um, tablets and pens to um, really speed up the annotation work. So, all right, so that's what they get, got actually. So from the input, the axons were really predicted well. And uh, if you take a look at the bottom right picture, um, the small red regions are basically um, what the um, algorithm missed, uh, or predicted false positive, sorry. And uh, we can see that there's a, a high sensitivity. There were almost no misses. So ECOSA basically offers you a very flexible way of operating efficient and an image analysis pipelines. We provide the service in the cloud or on-prem. There's also a free version on the cloud available, which I highly recommend you check out. And uh, you don't need data science or coding skills because we already abstract a lot away from the complex AI development process. And we also provide APIs to integrate our services. Uh, John mentioned it in his uh, intro that also the connection and uh, informatics part uh, of, of interconnecting these systems is um, covered properly. So I hope um, that my talk today um, has triggered many ideas on how AI can be beneficial for your image analysis. And you find contact information in the webinar info. Uh, of course, we are available on LinkedIn, directly by email and so on. And uh, feel free to reach out to us, maybe also doing a first proof of concept project where you can also get your hands on experience. And uh, in addition, we are also happy to offer you a guided trial period of up to four weeks during which you can uh, get uh, workshops. We can uh, do some consultations on image annotation. And uh, we also answer your questions related to the product, data, AI training processes, whatever, in the context of your specific um, analytical challenge. And with that, I conclude. Thanks for your attention. Uh, back to you, John. Thanks, Philip, very much. Great presentation. Uh, and now, uh, uh, Dr. Christoph Gonsler from Perkin Elmer. Last but not least. <laughs> Thanks, Philip. Okay. I hope you can see my screen. And yep. Yeah, thanks for the uh, nice introduction. Before, like, like when, when we started the seminar, and I cannot tell you how amazed I was of a, of a single picture. When I had the honor to help with the, uh, with, with the research of the HPV, of the human papilloma virus vaccine, and, and when I first got my hands on my, I had, I had cloned, I had expressed and purified, uh, virus-like particles, and then to see them under the X-ray was was just amazing. And, and then to know that this will be one day becoming a, a a vaccine that is used around the world is just is it was amazing. That's 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 the power of these pictures. So when you can show these, that's that's a real um, that's a that, that's a real uh, that 
always a real, really good thing. So I'm going to talk today about our idea at Perkin Elmer that we're really coming, and this is all about high content screening now, um, from cells to images, to numbers, to knowledge. And I will, I will really uh, focus today on the, um, on the idea that really high content screening combines automated fluorescence microscopy with quantitative image analysis. And this allows, of course, the acquisition of, in this case, unbiased multi-parametric data at the single cell level. And that's what it's all about. So this is um, this is a quote from a paper, but this is this is really what what we are doing. And today I would like to introduce our next generation high content screening image management and an analysis software called Signals Image Art. It's it has been recently released, and I will I will focus almost my entire talk on the software, uh, knowing that of course Perkin Elmer has the full bandwidth and I will talk about that um, now. So we are, we're, we're, we're doing everything from the sample handling here on the right, uh, on the left, sorry, and the, um, we have of course our microscopes, the automated versus microscopes like an Ore Operator CLS or an Opera Phoenix Plus now. And uh, we have the reagents like the Finoview and, uh, and, and the plates of course, and then we acquire the images. So this is all of these things uh, we do, and I'm happy to talk about, but not today. I will hurry up a little. Um, so we really, um, we really have. We're focusing today on this image analysis and image management um, software called Signals Image Artist. And I'm, I'm also happy to, to move every all the questions about what we're doing as a secondary analysis with this in our profiling and hit selection, or even where we're using uh, statistics ML, uh, so machine learning. I'm, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to, to call everything AI, but this is this is where we're actually doing a lot to actually not not only capture the images and analyze them and, and to make sure that we get the most out of the measurements in the image, but also then in the secondary analysis to look uh, where are the outliers? Where are the similarities? What what shows an effect? And according to a treatment or um, yeah, a, a exposure time and so on. So these these are the things that that we help our customers with, and it's really coming from the from the from the robotics in the end of the sample handling to the uh, statistics and machine learning algorithms that we can use in the secondary analysis. And how does that work? So the data workflow is pretty simple. We have in our Harmony product, this is, this is the, the software that comes with the, with the instrument that can actually acquire the images and, and make sure that everything is read incorrectly. And then today I'm going to talk about this middle part, which is the image analysis and the management of, this, of, of the massive amounts of data and uh, as I said, if you're more interested in our signal screening product, secondary analysis, how to actually make sense of all of that data, then then uh, please reach out, and uh, we can can definitely show you how to do this. But for those of you who are in high content screening, there's an, and and you probably also know um, Perkin Elmer for like doing high content screening. We have we have really really nice software tool, software programming language, however you call it, in a cappella, um, that does the image analysis for us. So this is, the, and we have combined them, um, like like in, in, in short or longer building blocks that of this language that the user can just choose from. And then the user will actually go in and, and build the analysis block by block. There's a 2D analysis, there's 3D analysis, there's of course, cell painting. The, the, there is actually one cell painting um, block now because that's that's just you just have to tell the block how big, how many features you would like to extract. And there is, uh, and thanks to the uh, to the uh, previous talks, there's fast kinetics, so we can actually show um, we we can actually look at living cells as well. 
So this is this is all part of the um, part of the software, part of the Signals Image Artist software, and we not only support Perkin Elmer instruments, but of course we're happy to um, and uh, sell you more. But there's also, of course, a Kogawa GE molecular devices in the, yeah are in the market, and and you can you can just combine all of that. You can read all of these into Signals Image Artist, and then um, yeah, well, do your data analysis or the primary analysis and so forth. And just to take you through a quick workflow, there's a couple of example workflows here. So what you do in a 2D way, of course, is well, you use, start with segmentation. And this would be a building block. And you say, OK, I would like to, for example, find the, my, my nuclei and the cytoplasm. And then you can refine it. You can say, well, I actually want the cytoplasm without the membrane, and then I need to quantify something. So I, I can say, well, give me the texture as a feature out. So how does the cell look internally? And and then classify these and say, well, do we have different populations? In this case, for example, if we have if we have the um, if, if we have structures in the cell that break down due to a treatment or whatever. Now we can actually see these and quantify these and classify them. And then in the end, we, we, we go over to our, um, our secondary analysis and, and really see how the treatments affect the, the different uh, measurements of the cell. Same thing is true, a very similar thing is true for 3D Im image analysis workflows. Here's a, a cysts that, that, that we can measure. And of course, as we just heard, you need the, the Z stack for it. You need to know where where what is, and then you don't need uh, not only to find the individual cells, but also, of course, you first have to identify the cysts here, and then find the nuclei in these cysts, and find single cells, and then calculate the specific properties for evaluation, like really then 3D things like the volume or surface area and so on. So there is there is a lot of additional information that you can get out of 3D and then of course also look at the uh, data analysis, the secondary analysis later on. And last but not least, cell painting, everybody's talking about it. So there is um, there is the, there, there is a way to really make sure you can do cell painting assays and co cope with all of that data that comes out. And so there is really this the, the idea of like having a projection of all of that maximum intensities. Then you again segment the cells, you select the cells that you actually can look at, and like not well, not at the order. And then you quantify your properties, whatever. If you want five thousand, then you do five thousand. And and then again you have to analyze these and, and make sure that you're looking at the right things and you have um, you're seeing effects that are really effects. And so, well, we have an IT requirement for high content screening, and these are pretty high. So you need scalable storage. You need an object store. You need like cloud-based, or if you have it locally, we, we, we come with a min-IO if, if there are IT people um, in the audience. So this, you, can you can still install this image artist, sequence image artist in well, on on premises, on your premises, in your in your own computer center, and uh, but you would you would use the same technologies, and we made sure that we are using the same technologies as you would use in the Amazon cloud, for example. So, but you can of course um, directly put it into the cloud of Amazon, for example. And then you need, and this is this is very true for almost everything. Like if you're creating over a terabyte of data a day, you have to have the ability to crunch these numbers. And this is, we're doing this with parallel compute and uh, high performance compute. There is like, where we have the possibility, we'll come with this learn cluster. So there is, um, there's everything that you need to scale this 60 nodes, 100 nodes, however many you have or want, um, you, can, you can parallelize these. And, and make sure that there is enough, uh, or that, that this, this comes back quick enough. And 
Well, there's one bottleneck that everybody has, network speed. And this is, this is we're, we, we make sure in our software that, that we're using the full bandwidth that is allowed by your, um, by your IT or what the IT allows you. And we're making, well, we're trying to make sure that we have a very, very low latency on both sides to actually make sure we can get all of the data from the, from the instrument to your compute cluster in the, well, in the fastest way. And with that, I'm happy to uh, take questions with all the others that have presented today. And uh, I hope this, is, uh, this gave you a nice short overview of uh, what our Signals Image Artist is doing for you. That was great, Christoph. Uh, some, some awesome things. Thanks for announcing that today. Um, if you want to put your questions in the Q&A or in the chat box um, for the different vendors, that would be great. We'll take those in as they come. Uh, learned a lot today. I hope everybody else did as well. Uh, you know, one of the things that I saw, um, I'll just go in order from the Altus perspective, is that quality of life, like actually helping patients make better decisions, but also helping clinicians make better decisions. So Felix, how, you know, that's a, that's a really important thing. And how's that playing out today with, with patients and, and clinicians? I mean, you can see, and if you've ever had to unfortunately experience this in the world of oncology, you can kind of see that um, sometimes you have to figure out how to navigate through the diagnosis and outsmart the cancer. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think the, you know, a prognosis doesn't just have utility in, in clinical trials, um, but as you're saying, it's, um, it's really the basis for treatment decision making. And just because, you know, you, you have a non-small cell lung cancer diagnosis, um, you know, the art is then really deciding and knowing how aggressive is the cancer so that you can really match match the disease, uh, match the treatment to the disease that you're treating. Um, and, uh, you know, either de-escalate treatment um, to, you know, uh, reduce the likelihood of toxicity and adverse events in a patient versus, um, uh, you know, um, intensifying treatment in, in some more, uh, you know, aggressive forms of cancer. So having that, understa that understanding uh, at diagnosis of what the prognosis is for a patient can be very powerful uh, to help physicians and patients make the best choices um, to generate the best outcomes. Yeah, extremely powerful. And I think, unfortunately, there's some areas there where certain hospitals, certain clinicians follow protocols, right? And you almost have to self-educate yourself. And I, I see your platform being able to do that, to really help from both sides of the fence, uh, from a patient and a clinician perspective. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah, and we're lucky to work with some of the world's best oncologists at the, the cancer centers that we work with. And, yep. and you know, those are the use cases that, that they get very excited about um, and uh, you know, really hoping to advance the, uh, the concept of precision medicine going forward with them. Very cool. Um, and I noticed uh, with Peter, um, the, the live cell microscopy, I mean, Peter, how many years of work has it taken to get to this point? That is a very, very, very good question. When I started in microscopy in 91, we did uh, Polaroid imaging and the movies were on a, on a Bolex film. Mm -hmm. Now, now we, we work on nanowatts of laser light. I'm sure at that time, if you would said, one day we take an image with a nanowatt, you know, no, nobody would believe it. But right. forward, -looking, the forward looking, there is um, uh, now also we can use photonic structures to grow cells on. And this photonic structure even can increase the light intensity with a factor of 100. And now new dyes will become available that are much more brighter than the current dyes. Yeah. So the nanowatt can, can go down. Well, there's no doubt in my mind the future's bright for everyone that gave a talk today, and I I just see it. I mean, that's uh, I guess that's why I do what I do, and I 
am what I am, but I see I see the future sometimes, and I'm just blown away by what you guys have shown today. Um, there's one question that came in, Felix. Where do you currently sit on the regulatory landscape, and what are the next steps there? It's a good question. Yeah, and uh, Trevor, uh, thanks for asking. Uh, great to to see you again, and congrats on your recent move to Histowiz. That's a fantastic company. Um, good question on the regulatory front. So. When it comes to the um, the imaging biomarkers that we're developing for for clinical trials, uh, that's for research use only for exploratory research that um, sponsors can do uh, on their existing clinical trial data sets. When it comes to um, you know the use cases that that John and I were just talking about on the the clinical decision support side, uh, they're very early days, uh, and they're obviously there. Um, there's going to need to be some ongoing discussions with, with regulators as to how that fits into clinician workflow, how that factors into their decision making. Uh, and there's some really exciting work also kind of being done in um, stratification and response assessment in the, um, in, on the CTDNA side as well. So uh, some interesting precedents being set there. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um... I have a question for Philip. I mean, Philip, what I see is a very capable platform, imaging platform that goes across a lot of modalities um, in, in, in very targeted ways. Uh, you, and again, like everyone on the call, I can see your passion coming out uh, in your talk and what you do. Um, you touched on what I, what the, some of the really big pillars today and the informatics side of things, like the cultural side of things, the people, the model quality data needed to drive the AI ML, um, and then just that overall diverse set applicability. Where do you see you guys making some big impacts in the next six months or so? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So uh, as you said, we have uh, so many different use cases and I think the, the most um, obvious choice to, to make a big impact is in um, supporting individuals um, in, in yet yeah, clearly deriving their own um, results from their own data uh, without having to rely on uh, image data scientists or something like this right. because uh, this is um, a breed that is not around a lot right so um, if you take a look, for example, at the academic um, landscape and you have there the competence centers for core uh, or core facilities yeah. uh, who do a lot of uh, imaging and, and image analysis on a service uh, basis, um, many of these uh, use cases, they, they are really just stalled because they are full of load. And uh, I think what, what we are trying to do is to give back the independence to the researchers uh, such that they can arrive at their um, yeah, expected results much earlier uh, and are not depending on, on someone. Yeah, no, that sounds great. And I, I see what you're saying. Academia, startups, small biotech, you know, as you know, we both know, like some of the larger companies have a lot of imaging researchers, a lot of coders and stuff. So, but being able to really facilitate in, the, in some of those, you're, I think you're going to make some pretty awesome inroads and in, uh, you're going to help people make some great discoveries. So it was really good to see that. Um, we have a question for uh, uh, Christoph. Um, is the signal image imaging artist, is that an upgrade to Columbus? Or is it using a newer acapella module? You know, so you've got a lot of users of this HCS system. So they're going to start yes. to ask these types of questions. Yes, it just, just, yeah, so this is a completely new software. Um, it's, it's using the latest acapella, um, works backwards compatible, but yeah, we can, we can definitely take that offline and, and, and talk you through everything. And, okay. Uh, yeah, it's a new, we, we have recreated that. And so. Uh, Sounds good. Columbus. And then his second question is, is there a deconvolution ability in signal image artist? I that that might 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 be an acapella. I have actually I I don't know the the answer. I have to come back to you. With that. Okay. All right. So I'll let you uh, follow up with uh, Stephen on that. Yes. So high content screening is a is a big deal, and and you uh, 
we can see that the evolution over time and you know some of the things i talked about in the scientific informatics part for years people struggled with you know storage management uh it's too small a pipes to pass big images around and you know and we've evolved and a lot of the environments are a lot better and now you guys have gone to a next generation software capability you've probably addressed a lot of those it sounds like you did in your talk um it's pretty exciting and do you see a, an uptick in hcs over the past couple of years or has it been a steady steady growth over time no we have we have seen an uptick um especially when when it comes to like really selling the um coming from the from the bigger instruments that people are really heavily investing in the capabilities of these, these of, of an opera phoenix opera phoenix plus that then they have to analyze as well so there is like this just comes down the, <laughs> the pipe when you um when you invest in these in these bigger instruments you also have to make sure that you can actually analyze it in a timely fashion right i mean these these instruments are producing as i said it's easy to produce over a terabyte a day so you have to you just have to cope with that somehow right absolutely um here here's one i do do any of the speakers have questions for the other companies is there anything you're curious about that you saw today is uh, do you see synergies with each other you know etc i i i just i'm kind of blown away by what i saw today from everyone so it's uh i don't want to I don't want to forego the B2B part of this as well, because I think there's definitely synergies here with these, with all of you. Any thoughts on that? Two competitive synergies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think if I may say, there's, yeah. uh, there's a cross point, you know, uh, I know came out vision uh, in the past. We have been talking, we'll be talking in future again, because uh, you know, what they do, our customers need. You know. Yeah. It's our new instrument. We want to go deep and fast. And this is also something Perkin Elmo wants to do. And now yeah. I can take a Perkin Elmo, you know. Now we have something better than speaking this today. Yeah. So, and I think it's important for the audience to hear too that, hey, you guys are willing to work together. So that's a, that's a great thing. Um, uh, and that's a good spirit. Okay. Well, um, we don't have any more questions coming in. I'll just double check. Uh, I thought it was great. Appreciate everybody's time and uh, best of luck. And I'm sure we'll be talking soon in the near future. Thank great you job. Forward to that. Yeah. Thanks very much. You. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.